This is Nauvoo, Illinois. In 1844, the largest city in the state. The Mississippi River half encircles the Nauvoo Township. And as spring wends its way into summer, the river echoes with the sounds of the stern whalers carrying passengers and cargo up and down the majestic waterway. Eighteen forty four was an election year, and the United States presidency was in the offing. For this reason, two gentlemen from the East had come to visit this unusual city. The two men, Charles Francis Adams and Josiah Quincy, who later this year was to become mayor of Boston, had come to study the political complexion of what was then the Western United States. They had come to meet the founder and mayor of Nauvoo. Joseph Smith, the prophet of the latter days. In Nauvoo lived more than 11,000 members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith had only recently declared himself a candidate for the presidency of the United States. Quincy and Adams were anxious to meet this unusual man, the leader of the thousands of Latter-day Saints. Both Quincy and Adams were well aware that this dedicated man and his loyal followers had been victims of severe religious persecution. But at that moment, Joseph Smith was to Josiah Quincy a rare phenomenon, still to be explained. Quincy was immediately impressed with Joseph Smith's handsome, robust appearance as the two visitors were invited inside for an interview. It's a great pleasure, gentlemen, to have you call. Thank you, sir. Here. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Please be seated and take your ease. Mr. Adams and I deeply appreciate your hospitality, Mr. Smith. Now, Mr. Quincy, Mr. Adams, what is it I can do for you? We have heard many interesting reports about yourself and your followers. Would you be so kind as to answer some questions? Certainly, I shall be pleased, Mr. Quincy. What is it you'd like to know? As Mr. Adams and I rode up from the river, we noticed the neatness and orderly appearance of your city. And so first, we are most anxious to learn how you have managed to govern your people so well. <laughs> Thank you. I simply teach them correct principles, and they govern themselves. And what are those principles? They are the same principles taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that true happiness can come only through living the teachings of Christ. Our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, believes in Christ as the literal Son of God, the Savior of the world. But surely, Mr. Smith, these same beliefs are shared by all Christian faiths, are they not? Gentlemen, the gospel of Christ is practiced today, and that which Jesus taught are two different things. What do you mean by that, Mr. Smith? Just this, Mr. Quincy. Over the centuries, Christianity drifted away from the original teachings of Christ. Doctrines were changed. Divinely established ordinances were discarded. New creeds were written. Until now, the Christianity of this century, in many ways, does not resemble what Christ taught. But to save mankind, the Lord has given us a new revelation of himself and has restored his church and kingdom in purity upon the earth. Do you mean, then, that until now, not even the best-intentioned Christian and his family have been living the teachings of Christ? They haven't known enough about his teachings. How, then, could they live them? But his gospel is now on earth 
restored for all who will receive it. Will you tell us how this came to be? To do so, I must go back to the year 1820, when I was a young lad of 14. I was living near the village of Palmyra in western New York. At that time, there was much religious conflict. So great was the confusion among the different denominations that it was impossible for a person young as I to know who was right and who was wrong. One day I went to my room, wondering which of these religions was right. I asked myself, if any be right, which is it? And how shall I know it? And then in the family Bible, I read these words from the epistle of James. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Never did any passage of scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. I reflected on it again and again, knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. So I retired to the woods to make the attempt it was on a beautiful, clear day in the spring of 1820. Having looked around me and finding myself alone, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name and said, pointing to the other, this is my beloved son, hear him. My object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. I was answered that I must join none of them because they teach for doctrines the commandments of men. And so astonished as I was at this miraculous experience, I was told that I would receive further word. The Lord had a special purpose for me to be revealed at a later date. This testimony of yours is one of the most astounding things I have ever heard. Since you were only 14 years old, did anyone believe you when you first told of your experience? Yes. I first told my mother, and she believed me. And then I told my father and my brothers and sisters, and they believed me. But I'm sure you can understand that the story of my vision excited great prejudice against me. Yes. Indeed I do, Mr. Smith. Your testimony is most remarkable. When was it, then, that you published the Book of Mormon, as I believe it is called? The Book of Mormon is a truly miraculous work. But I can take no credit for the writing of it, Mr. Quincy. Oh? How is that? This book is a record of the ancient inhabitants of America. It was written by prophets who ministered to the forebears of these Indians of the Americas just as the Old Testament prophets recorded their histories here in the Bible. The Book of Mormon was actually written during the same period of time. These peoples of early America engraved their records on thin metal plates. What did these plates look like? They appeared to have been made of a metal-like gold, 
to preserve them through the ages. In what language were they written? The hieroglyphics are called Reformed Egyptian. Reformed Egyptian. Here, see this copy I made of the type of characters that were inscribed on those plates. Isn't that interesting? But how did you ever decipher them? Well, I didn't know the language, Mr. Quincy. However, by the gift and power of God, I did translate the record of the Book of Mormon. Why is it called the Book of Mormon? It's named for an ancient American prophet named Mormon. He abridged it from many similar records, kept over a period of centuries by even earlier American prophets. But how, then, did these golden plates happen to fall into your hands, Mr. Smith? I received them from a heavenly messenger. His name was Moroni, the son of Mormon. As a mortal man... Joseph Smith went on to tell Quincy and Adams how Moroni delivered the golden plates to him. He described how Moroni, as a mortal man, deposited them here on this hill near Palmyra sometime before his death early in the fifth century. On the side of this hill called Camorra, as a part of the restoration of the gospel, God sent Moroni to have Joseph translate the plates, for they contained the gospel in its purity. These metal plates had been inscribed by Mormon. This early American prophet abridged the records of many preceding centuries and at the same time inscribed current writings on the metal plates. The Book of Mormon testifies that Jesus is the Christ, as does the Bible, as the Bible is the Holy Writ of Palestine and the Eastern Hemisphere, so the Book of Mormon is the scripture of ancient America and the Western Hemisphere. That evening in their lodgings, Quincy wrote a letter to his wife as Adams became absorbed in the Book of Mormon. Neither man felt he yet really understood Joseph Smith. I stand puzzled before this man, Charles. He is unschooled by his own admittance, yet he is one of the most Brilliant men I have ever met. Here is an impression I was writing to my wife. I say, it is very possible that some future textbook will contain a question something like this. What American of the 19th century has wielded the greatest influence upon the destinies of his countrymen? The answer might well be Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. Joseph Smith was a modern apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, duly ordained to this position. Three of Christ's original apostles came to Joseph Smith and his close friend Oliver Cowdery and conferred upon them the divine authority held by the apostles themselves. John the Baptist also came and conferred on them the same priesthood that he held which was the divine power to baptize for the remission of sins. These divine ordinations to the priesthood came during the period of translation and publication of the Book of Mormon and in preparation for this reestablishment of Christ's true church in modern times. It was during this same period that Martin Harris, a close friend, helped Joseph Smith with the Book of Mormon translation. Shortly after he started the transcribing in early 1828, Martin Harris acted on a sudden impulse. He was not yet thoroughly convinced of Joseph Smith's divine work and wanted to find out more about the ancient records. With Joseph Smith's permission, he took the drawings of some of the hieroglyphics together with the corresponding translations. Martin Harris planned to submit these characters to scientists and linguists. Then, possibly by their verdict, he would decide whether or not to establish or withdraw his half-yielded faith. So Harris went to Columbia College in New York City and there visited Professor Charles Anthon, an eminent authority in Greek, Latin, and other ancient languages. Most unusual. Very interesting, Mr. Harris. These hieroglyphics are undoubtedly authentic, and the translation you have shown me is correspondingly accurate. 
Would you be so kind then, Professor Anthon, to write a statement certifying your opinion? Oh, I shall be glad to do so. This translation is more complete and perfect than any of this language I have ever seen. But tell me, are there other sheets of characters like these? No, there are no others. Mm. Here's your certificate. Thank you, Professor. Just where did you get this copy of these ancient characters? The young man who worked on this translation received a large record on many individual metal plates filled with these ancient writings. Indeed. And how did your young friend come by these metal plates, may I ask? Joseph Smith has testified that an angel led him to a place near Palmyra where they had been deposited in the ground. An angel? Yes, sir. A ministering angel. Mr. Harris. Let me have that certificate a moment. There is no such thing as a ministering angel. But, Professor Anthon, you said the characters were genuine. It would be better if the entire book of plates which your young friend has dug up might be brought to me. Then I shall be willing to translate the entire work for you. Oh, I'm afraid that would be prohibited. Why? Because, well, you see, sir, only a portion of the records was intended for translation. Well, where are the rest of the records? I could look those over. Well, that would be impossible, sir. What? Who said so? The angel did. The angel said this portion of the records must remain sealed. Well, I cannot read a sealed book. But, Professor Anthon, just a moment ago, you said that these were genuine. How come you changed your... Professor Anthon's reply fulfilled a prophecy from the Bible where Isaiah wrote, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Other men besides Joseph Smith saw the golden plates of the Book of Mormon. Three of these men and Joseph's wife Emma testified as follows. Emma Smith said, My belief is that the Book of Mormon is of divine authenticity. I have not the slightest doubt of it. I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writing of the manuscripts unless he was inspired. And Oliver Cowdery testified, I wrote with my own pen the entire Book of Mormon, save a few pages, as it fell from the lips of the prophet Joseph Smith, as he translated it by the gift and power of God. David Whitmer said, It was in the latter part of June, 1829. Joseph, Oliver Cowdery, and myself were together. They were shown to us in this way. Joseph and Oliver and I were overshadowed by a light more glorious than that of the sun. And in the midst of this light appeared a table upon which were many golden plates. Martin Harris testified, I know the Book of Mormon is true. I know that the plates have been translated by the gift and power of God, for his voice declared it. Therefore, I know of a surety that the work is true. And as many of the plates as Joseph Smith translated, I handled with my hands plate after plate. Shortly after the Book of Mormon was published in Palmyra, a most significant meeting took place on this nearby farm in Fayette, New York, on April 6th, 1830. Joseph Smith and five close associates under direct authorization from heaven, organized again on earth the true church of Jesus Christ. By divine direction, the church was named the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith's enemies continued to brand his work as heresy, stating that God no longer appears to man as he did in Bible times. Mounting persecution drove the church members from New York to Kirtland, Ohio, near Lake Erie. 
where the first permanent settlement of the saints was established. There the Lord commanded them to build a temple which still stands today. Erected in 1836, it was the first Latter-day Saint temple. Important divine revelations came to Joseph Smith within the Kirtland Temple. Before its dedication, while with his close associate Oliver Cowdery, Joseph Smith was there visited by Jesus Christ. Of this great experience, the prophet wrote, We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold in color like amber. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. It was also during this period that Joseph Smith prophesied the American Civil War nearly 30 years before that war began. Verily thus saith the Lord concerning the wars that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. For behold, the southern states shall be divided against the northern states. And the southern states will call on other nations, even the nation of Great Britain, as it is called. They shall also call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations. And then war shall be poured out upon all nations. Continuing persecution and mob violence forced the Latter-day Saints to move again, this time to Jackson County in Missouri. But religious prejudice blinded men's eyes. Persecution continued soon again. False charges were made against Joseph repeatedly. One day late in November, he was forcibly taken from his home and with several loyal associates was confined in a small jail at Liberty, Missouri. This replica of that jail now stands on the same spot in Liberty where Joseph Smith was confined during the winter of 1838 and 39. Here he sat at a crude writing table while huddled below, his companions slept in a dungeon. The heavy timbers and rock masonry walls precluded any possibility of escape. During the bitter winter, Joseph and his followers suffered almost intolerable hardships. But here he received some of his most impressive revelations. Filled with anguish, he prayed for relief from the tribulations that had come upon the church. Oh God, where art thou? How long shall thy hand be stayed? Behold the wrongs done to thy people. O oh Lord, how long shall they suffer these unlawful oppressions? My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment. And then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. Persecution continued to mount in Missouri, and the saints were soon compelled to leave. When 
Joseph was released from Liberty Jail in the spring of 1839, he sought refuge for his saints in Illinois. They converted a swampland on a bend in the Mississippi River into the prosperous and beautiful city of Nauvoo. The industrious Latter-day Saints soon built handsome, comfortable homes like this one owned by Orson Hyde. Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram have been visiting. Hiram is now the patriarch of the church. Substantial homes were built such as this one belonging to Brigham Young. And this house owned by Wilfred Woodruff. This homestead was the first Nauvoo home of the prophet Joseph Smith and his family. Joseph and his family lived here until the mansion house situated nearby was completed in 1843. Originally, it contained 22 rooms. Joseph Smith taught that the Constitution of the United States is an inspired document, a glorious standard, and that it was given to guarantee freedom and liberty to every man. He said that the framers of the Constitution were raised up by the Almighty and inspired to write that document. He taught from the Book of Mormon that America is a choice land. In less than five years, the saints in Nauvoo erected this majestic temple. It was 128 feet long, 88 feet wide, and its gleaming spire reached nearly 160 feet from the ground. One of Joseph Smith's memorable prophecies was made while he lived in Nauvoo. The prophet stood on the banks of the Mississippi on a warm summer day. He held in his hand a dipper of cool water. As he lifted it to his lips, he saw a vision of the Rocky Mountains, of the clear canyon streams, and the beautiful mountain valleys. He said that the water which he drank tasted much like the crystal streams that run down from the snow-capped peaks. As the spirit of prophecy came upon him, he said, I prophesy that the saints will be driven to the Rocky Mountains and become a mighty people. Just a few miles from Nauvoo stands this sandstone building, the old jail at Carthage, Illinois. Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram were again arrested on false charges and forced to stay here. As he was taken into the jail, the prophet said, I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am calm as a summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward all men. The next day, Joseph and Hiram were taken to an adjoining room in the jail. Representatives of the church attempted to meet with the governor of Illinois to obtain protection from mob violence to no avail. Having already prophesied his own death, Joseph sorrowfully thought, I would like to see my family again. Oh, that I could preach to the saints in Nauvoo once more. At 5.21 p.m. on June 27, 1844, martyrdom took the lives of the prophet and his brother here at Carthage Jail. The sorrowing followers of Joseph and Hiram Smith published the following. We announce the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, the prophet, 
and Hiram Smith, the patriarch. They were shot by an armed mob of between 150 and 200 persons. In the short space of 20 years, Joseph Smith had brought forth the Book of Mormon and sent the fullness of the everlasting gospel to the four quarters of the earth. Joseph Smith founded a great city and left a fame and name that cannot be slain. He lived great and he died great in the eyes of God and his people. And like most of the Lord's anointed, he has sealed his mission and his works with his own blood. In life, Joseph and his brother Hiram were not divided and in death they were not separated. And he left us his profound testimony that Jesus is the Christ. And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him, even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father that by him and through him and of him, the worlds are and were created. 